Gateville specific campus is located, the Gateville people of the Eora Nation. Please respect the elders of the today of the knowledge, tradition, culture of their people and their land. The theme for today's conference is religious freedom and inclusivity, compatibility, conflict and the future. Let me start by outlining the agenda for today. It's going to be a busy day and we will be starting and finishing every session on time. That's one thing I can assure you. Uh, today we're going to hear from 18 speakers drawn from different parts of the world and different parts of the country. Each speaker is going to speak for a maximum of 15 minutes, which will be rigorously, vigorously and unwaveringly enforced. At the end of each group of speakers, we have set aside 15 minutes for questions. We only have a maximum of 15 minutes for questions after each session, so we would like to have short questions. If we do not hear a question within a short time, the moderator reserves the right to move on to someone else who actually wants to ask a question. While we appreciate that may seem discourteous, we are trying to be inclusive and not discourteous. Indeed, we seek your courtesy and respect our request to have our presenters respond to short questions and respond to their papers. We're going to have a 15 minute break for morning tea at 10.15 and a 75 minute break for lunch at noon during which some people may wish to attend Mass in St Benedict's Church, which is the oldest consecrated Catholic Church in Australia and is directly across from us here. Uh, Mass starts at 12.35 and runs for 30 minutes. We'll also have a 30 minute break for afternoon tea at half past two. We are providing food and beverages to you, so there's no need to go off campus in search of food and drink, and no excuse for being late to any session. As I said, the sessions will start and end precisely at the time printed in the program, so if you are late for the resumption of any of the sessions, that would be most disrespectful to the speaker at, the, at that time, as you'll miss part of the talk. Um, particularly disrespectful not to be here at 9 o'clock when I'm speaking. Uh, the program has details of each speaker, and we're assuming that you have or you can read the biographies. So as a result, the introductions of speakers today will be limited to <laughs> so, who's speaking about what today? After this introduction, I'm going to start the conference off by discussing the topic The Exclusivity Demands of Religion Meet the Exclusivity Demands of Inclusion The Case for a New Approach to Inclusion in Australia And I'll be followed by Dr Ian Benson Who will answer the question, is inclusion another meaningless word in the context of religious freedom? Ian will be followed by Dr Gil Kalakanon, who will discuss weaponising otherness against the Baha'i in Iran. I think together those three talks will really set the overall theme for the conference um, because the first two um, deal with the theme in a, in a broad kind of way and then we start to deal in more specifics um, in particular issues around the world. Um, there will then be 15 minutes of question time for those three speakers. And then we have one more uh, the second session will start at 10.30 with Asha Towers discussing inclusion in the proposed New South Wales Religious Discrimination Act. Adjunct Professor Paul Taylor will then ask the question, what on earth does Australia think of religious freedom? Not very inclusive is his answer. Adjunct Associate Professor Michael Stokes will then ask whether Section 17 protects individuals or groups from offence in Tasmania. Then Professor Sean DeFreitas, who is visiting us from South Africa, We'll discuss the topic, interpreting laws to include religious believers in civil society. Before Michael DeMarco, who's an honour student of ours, rounds out that session and we move into questions and a well-deserved lunch. We'll resume after lunch at 1.15 with Dr Kevin Wagner from our School of Philosophy and Theology and he's going to speak on The Outsiders, a survey of exclusion and inclusion in the Christian scriptures. Anna Walsh will follow and speak on abortion law reform, a message of exclusion to pro-life citizens. We'll then hear Charles Wilson's paper, Discrimination Laws Need to be Reset to Achieve Inclusion, which will be read uh, at 1.45, followed by our final speaker at that session, Dr Alex Deegan, who will be discussing love and inclusion translated into law. After questions, we'll have afternoon tea at 2.30. Final session gets underway at 3 o'clock with Associate Dean Pete Thompson, asking if religious freedom has always been about inclusion. He'll be followed by Johnny Sackar, who will ask if inclusive religious freedom should silence should mean silencing Christians. Christine Story will then ask whether religious freedom requires the inclusion of all religious free speech. 
followed by Robert Pletier, who will discuss the inclusive message of Martin Luther King Jr. Hakan Kura will then discuss the concepts of freedom and inclusion in classic Islamic jurisprudence before Adjunct Associate Professor Mark Fowler will join us over the interweb from Canberra to challenge the ideas of letting judges decide what religious belief excludes religious beliefs that they don't understand. After questions, I'm reliably informed that Dr. Keith Thompson will provide a pithy and tumultuous summary of the day, uh, which will finish promptly at 5 p.m. So I don't know about you, I'm exhausted already, but it does sound like a great day, and it's going to be much better than that. So let's get underway. Okay, so this morning I'm going to argue for a new approach to inclusion in Australia. I'm going to begin by considering the exclusive demands made by successful religious traditions in their doctrines, traditions and faith claims. I'll then consider the origins and meaning of the term inclusion in the Western world and Australia and how the term is currently being employed. I'll argue that the contemporary Australian approach to inclusion ignores the exclusive demands made by religions on their adherence. I'll argue that a new and broader meaning of inclusion is necessary in Australia to minimise conflict and to actually protect religious freedom. The High Court of Australia in the Church of New Faith case identified two criteria for religion to be recognised as a religion in Australia. They are first, a belief in a supernatural being, thing or principle, and second, the acceptance of canons of conduct in order to give effect to that belief. So first, belief in a supernatural being, thing or principle, and second, the acceptance of canons of conduct in order to give effect to the belief. Our quarter and sources describe the following as traits with which all religions share. This is a quote from them. Belief in supernatural agents and counterintuitive concepts Communal participation in costly ritual, separation of the sacred and the profane, and the importance of adolescence as the life history phase most appropriate for the transmission of religious beliefs and values. Apologies to Ian Benson. In their view, these traits maximise the retention and transmission of a religious faith and effective engagement with it. The comment to the High Court and to Al Qaeda and Sosis' description is the identification of religion with demands on adherence to subscribe to obligations of behaviour, be they embodied in doctrine or ritual, which are different to those of the general community. As far as we can tell, people who have lived within a particular religious tradition have always behaved differently to those around them who subscribe to a different or to no religious tradition. The very reason we know about the longevity of religious belief in human history is that human beings have always acted on their religious faith. They have done things, they have created art, they have created places of worship, and they have buried their dead in particular religious ways. This is in fact a fundamental feature of a religion. Religions make demands on their followers, they impose duties, they have their own doctrines and moral codes of behaviour which their believers are expected to follow. Religious people are, in other words, called on by their religious faith to think and behave differently to other people. This is at the core of religion and at the heart of being a person of religious faith. Many examples could be provided, but the example of the behaviour of the early Christians will suffice to make good this point. The early Christians stood out from others around them in the Roman Empire for the very reason that they did not behave as the Romans did. Unlike the Romans around them, the early Christians did not worship the Roman gods. They got married. They did not practice infanticide, contraception or abortion. And instead, they had large families which they nurtured. They did not engage in the sexual behaviours common in the empire. And they cared for the sick and the poor. As Vardy has described it, a general feature of belonging to a religion is the need for conformity and loyalty, which can bind a community into a whole greater than the sum of its parts. The presence of such demands is the likelihood of a religion surviving and prospering. This can be seen by comparing the success of contemporary churches, which share the basic features of religion, described by Al Scorta and Sosis, with those which do not. 
or do not do so as comprehensively. The churches which make stricter demands on their followers are the churches which are prospering in the United States. In Australia, the proportion of Australians identifying as Catholic, Anglican and as members of the United Church all fell significantly between, significantly between 2011 and 2016. But that trend is not evident in the more strict churches in Australia. The Latter-day Saints, Seventh-day Adventists, Jehovah's Witnesses and Pentecostals all maintained a stable percentage share of the Australian population in the same period according to the last census. Worshippers within these traditions are called upon by the moral positions of their religious faith to live differently to the majority of the population. This is also true of the other religious traditions that I mentioned, but statistically followers of these traditions actually abide by their demands. Their members sacrifice pleasures and opportunities and risk social stigma due to their difference in behaviours and attitudes. Adherents of these more demanding and more exclusive religious traditions are more regular churchgoers, give more, have stronger religious beliefs, participate in more faith-based groups and are more likely to identify as being strong members of their faith. They are less likely to drink alcohol, to engage in premarital sexual activities or to experiment with new age or alternative religions. These stricter and more exclusive churches demand more from their congregations than do some other religious faiths. Ina Coney argues that it is the very existence of these demands which explains the success of these stricter religions. He says, he says that strict demands strengthen a church in three ways. They raise overall levels of commitment, they increase average rates of participation, and they enhance the net benefit of membership. The growth of worshippers within the Catholic Church, choosing par parishes which celebrate the traditional Latin Mass rather than using the vernacular, is another example of the phenomenon identified by Alcorta and Sosis and Ian Oconee. It is parishioners who choose to attend worship celebrated in the ancient church language of Latin who most conform their behaviour to the official teachings of the Catholic Church. This is in stark contrast to Catholics worshipping in parishes where priests use the vernacular in the Mass. Traditional Latin Mass goers almost uniformly attend weekly Mass and at least annual confession as mandated by the Catholic Church and disapprove of contraception, abortion and same-sex marriage. They also have more children and donate more of their income than do other Catholics. This form of worship <coughs> has experienced substantial growth in the United States and in Italy. This growth has occurred in those parishes make the most demands on their parishioners in the, form of, in the form of the style of worship that they choose. Rather than the liturgy being celebrated in the common language that will be understood by all attending these parishes, these parishes choose instead to worship in an ancient language which is rarely used outside the liturgy and the official church documents. In this way they clearly separate the sacred from the profane. In summary then, religion, and certainly successful religions, make demands of exclusivity on their adherents. One of the demands that many religions make on their followers is to let other people know about their faith. Christians are, for example, called to proclaim the message and welcome or unwelcome, insist on it, to refute falsehood, correct error, give encouragement, but to do all with patience and with care to instruct as St Paul puts it in his second letter to Timothy, chapter 4, verses 1 to 2 in the New Jerusalem Bible translation. I'll just repeat that again because I want you to think about that as we think about the exclusive demands of religion and the inclusivity idea uh, which is in the contemporary Australian atmosphere. So Paul says, proclaim the message and welcome or unwelcome, insist on it, refute falsehood, correct error, Give encouragement, but do all with patience and with care to instruct. So we can see here how religious traditions which make demands on their followers to behave differently to those around them and which encourage or require their followers to share their religious faith with others might be accused of being judgmental and of failing to be inclusive if that term means accepting and agreeing with every other person's way of living. 
The reality is that religious believers are very likely to be judgmental and non-inclusive in this sense due to the very nature of religion. A religion which did not have canons of conduct in order to give effect to its beliefs would cease to be a religion within the meaning of religion expressed by the High Court of Australia in Church of the New Faith. So what does and what should happen when these exclusivity demands of religion meet the exclusivity demands of inclusion? Answering this question first requires a consideration of the meaning of the term inclusion in Australia. As we all know, the term inclusion is in common usage in Australia today. As far as I can see, it first seems to have been identified in the literature in 1971, when Sheen described it as the degree to which an employee was an insider within an organisation. In 1998, Morbarak and Shireen referred to decades of research which had demonstrated the business benefits to be derived from increasing the level of commitment that employees feel towards their employer and the positive impact of feeling accepted by an organisation which had on employee commitment levels. They provided a definition of the concept of inclusion exclusion and their definition of that concept was this. We define inclusion exclusion as a continuum of the degree to which individuals feel a part of critical organisational processes such as access to information and resources, involvement in work groups and ability to influence the decision making process. It's unfortunate that Morbarak and Shireen's identification of interpersonal difference, relevant to their analysis, was confined to race, gender, age and ethnicity, and it omitted any specific identification or, or consideration of religion or religious belief. They argued that due to overt or covert discrimination, including racism, sexism and ageism, women the aged and people from different cultures and ethnic groups were often excluded from information and opportunity. But the identification of a limited group of characteristics and discrimination in discussions about discrimination and inclusion is not uncommon. It is, however, regrettable. People are much more compl complement, complicated than labelling according to certain characteristics or ours. People have a wide range of characteristics which can be very important to their self-perception and their behaviours. <laughs> And, and which can be more or less important to them over their lifespan. Mentioning some but not other characteristics is problematic. Religious beliefs are complex and variegated. Catering for the full range of religious sensitivities is not easy, but disregarding them entirely is hardly an inclusive approach. Some people with religious beliefs which preclude them from working on certain days or times of day can be offended by emails or phone calls made to them during those times. Some people with religious beliefs that preclude them from eating certain foods can be offended if those foods are offered to them at a business function or a meeting. Some people have religious beliefs which are not properly subsumed within the identification of culture or ethnicity, which make offering a handshake inappropriate. Some people may, due to religious beliefs about sex or for other reasons, be deeply offended if they were asked to identify their preferred pronouns or to participate in some way in a same-sex wedding or in medical procedures such as abortion or euthanasia. Some employees may be deeply offended if they are asked not to attend a meeting or to be involved in a project because a client or other members of staff prefer to deal with people of a sex which is different to that of the employee, whether that is for cultural or religious grounds or because the client is simply an unreformed sexist. Some employees, because of their deeply held religious beliefs, may not be able to refer to a client by their preferred pronoun, where that is other than their birth sex. As I noted earlier, some people feel obliged by their religious beliefs to share their religious faith with others. In 1994, Ahara and others described inclusion as the degree of acceptance one has by other members of the work system. They considered that an employee's access to sensitive information and decision-making influence were two important criteria by which inclusion could be evidenced. In 1999, Pellet added job security to that list of criteria. By 2006, Robertson was describing inclusion as focusing on removing obstacles to the full participation 
and contribution of employees to their organisations. In the same year, 2006, in her systematic blueprint for energising and utilising universities as a means of developing an architecture of inclusion, Stern argued the following. The project of achieving inclusive institutions is not only about eliminating discrimination or even increasing the representation of previously excluded groups. It is about creating the conditions enabling people of all races and genders to realise their capabilities as they understand them. All institutional citizens should be able to realise their potential and participate fully in the institution. Here Sturm called specifically for universities to use their positions of power to bring about inclusion within that broader sense. It's a far broader concept which has gained currency and become broader again in contemporary Australia than the concept discussed in the past. In this formulation of inclusion, Inclusion is not simply about providing staff with equal opportunities in the workplace. It is about creating not just workplaces, but an entire society which is supportive of particular minority groups and of behaviours which may be contrary to those of the moral traditions of religions. It is about separating those who are inclusive in this sense, willing and able to embrace these new moral codes and mores from those who resist and are not inclusive. In this approach, using language which might be perceived as presenting other than a positive endorsement of those which, with certain identified characteristics and behaviours, or self-identification categories, is contract contractually or legislatively proscribed. In what was a very pertinent passage to consider in the context of current approaches to an application of practices and policies of inclusion, in 1998, Warburg and Shurian made this observation. People tend to feel more comfortable with others with whom they share important characteristics, strengthening in-group, out-group perceptions and creating exclusionary behaviours. Perception patterns of in-group, out-group variability contribute to attitudes that close opportunities to those who are different. These processes increase the likelihood of exclusion of those who are different, that is, women, ethnic and racial minorities, and members of groups that may be defined or labelled different. A risk in contemporary approaches to inclusion is that certain minority characteristics and behaviours, but not others, are recognised as being deserving of inclusion. This can result in at least the ignoring of, if not the punishment of, people with other characteristics and attitudes towards the now lauded characteristics and behaviours who themselves have characteristics and behaviours which warrant respect and consideration. As the New South Wales Law Society's report on the future of the legal profession observed in the context of lawyers, lawyers continue to be held back from full participation due to a variety of factors, including gender, disability, family status, faith, and cultural identity. Practices of inclusion, which operate to exclude people with some characteristics, which, not, which might not be perceived as supportive of, or which might contrast with those within a group identified as warranting inclusive recognition, may operate effectively to exclude those with other characteristics not considered to be worthy of inclusion, inclusive recognition and treatment. This approach is more appropriately described as an exclusionary rather than an inclusionary approach. Real or true inclusion requires a much more nuanced and careful response to some aspects of culture, gender, religious and other differences than the contemporary approach to inclusion allows. The extent to which employees should conform to their employer's demands to behave in what the employer considers to be an inclusive manner, when these demands put the employee in conflict with his or her, her own conscience, religious beliefs or cultural background, is a complex question. It should at the very least be considered in the application of or any policies of inclusion. It may be far from inclusive for an employer to demand that every employee should always conform to the employer's notion of inclusivity or their client's wishes or expectations. The issue becomes even more intrusive on religious freedom when the state, not just the employer, when the state makes these demands of conformity on its citizens. A truly, a truly inclusive workplace and society is one which should at least recognise the very complex issues presented 
by the need to attract employees who are representative of the multi-faith, multi-racial, multicultural and pluralist Australia of today, and to recognise the irony and error of employees being asked, or worse expected and required by the employer, to subjugate their own characteristics in favour of those demanded by the employer or a prospective or, or actual clients or sponsors. In the Law Society report that I mentioned earlier, Leibich explains how Minter Ellison benefited from what he described as diversity in the workplace as follows. He said, the importance of diversity in the workplace is that it encourages people to be themselves at work. So you get more out of them. Employees who are more comfortable being themselves in the workplace are going to be mentally more at the, at the workplace. And you're also less likely to lose good talent if people feel comfortable at the workplace. I'm going to read that again because I want, to, want you to think about whether that's actually something which is being achieved in the current understanding of inclusivity. The importance of diversity in the workplace is that it encourages people to be themselves at work so you get more out of them. Employees who are more comfortable being themselves in the workplace are going to be more mentally at the workplace and you're also less likely to lose good talent if people feel comfortable at the workplace. That portrayal of diversity, which we might call real diversity, ought to be the goal of any policies of inclusion, which we might call policies of real or true inclusion. Achieving real diversity or true inclusion of this type is not easy. It requires sensitivity to the need to allow the difference in motivations and understandings of the world, not just amongst colleagues, but amongst employees, clients, and those with whom people interact on a day-to-day -day basis. This required recognition of the characteristics of employees and of clients is harder again. Making the client feel at ease at the expense of the ease of an employee involved might not always be the best approach. When applied to a society, real inclusion means recognising that everyone is different and not seeking to enforce conformity. Rather than creating an inclusive society, the contemporary approach to inclusion preferences those with certain characteristics and preferred behaviours over others. This approach is inimical, inimical to religious freedom and creates rather than reduces conflict. In practice, this form of inclusion is in fact not inclusive, as it makes those who have different views, be they religious or otherwise, feel at least excluded and worse subject to termination of employment, fines or other punishment, or re-education. This form of inclusion can operate to actively exclude such people through acts such as termination of their employment in response to an expression of religious belief. As a consequence, there is a need to re-examine inclusion and to adopt a truer form of inclusion in which the characteristics of all people and their behaviours driven by those characteristics are recognised and respected. Thanks for